Thank you, Pastor Hector. Um, as a church grows, uh, I believe Pastor Hector wants me to uh, dress more like him. Um, I'm definitely, uh, I'm not stylish at all. Uh, all my clothes are from Walmart. Uh, I don't believe in buying anything over $7. My whole entire life I felt that way. So when Pastor Hector got me these shoes on our one-year anniversary, I literally was like, what do you wear with those? Like, I have, I have no idea. Uh, but so these are $7 jeans at Costco I got yesterday. So it, it worked out. The shirt, Cassie, great job in designing it. We'll be selling those next week. Just want to say thank you so much. Well, today is a big day, and I'm sure all of you guys know, and, and most of you have had this day circled on your calendar for over 300 and some odd days, right? It's, it's uh, the national holiday of Grandparents Day. Wait, what? Who said football? <laughs> what? Grandp Dude, it's about family and community. Who said football? <laughs> nah, I know it's football. It's my season two as well. Yay, Pittsburgh. I don't even want to tell you what's happening right now. Ugh. I'm so sorry. You don't, have you not updated your thing? Ugh, don't look. So, hey, the Niners, I'm rooting for you all that. But I want you to know I'm a UFC football fan. I, the Niners, congratulations. Yeah, you're Brock Birdie. He loves Jesus. I'll root for that. But other than that, I'm a UFC football fan. I've always tried to persuade every single person in my entire life to be a UFC or college football fan. And the reason why is every game matters. Your guys' games all don't matter. They don't. You guys can go 9-8 and eight and still make the playoffs, which I think, Pastor Aaron, you're just rooting to break even for Pittsburgh, right? <laughs> but every game matters. So basically, like, uh, any Cowboy fans in here? Okay, okay. Since there's one and you look like you're a nice guy, you'll let me say this joke. Uh, I would never say to a Raider fan. But the Cowboys, you desperately want to experience a Super Bowl again, right? You desperately. As a USC football fan, I have a Super Bowl every single week because that game matters so much. So you'll never experience a Super Bowl ever again, and we will experience at least 12 of them this year. I'm just kidding. I'm rooting for your Cowboys, too, as well. Dak Prescott just signed $242 million this morning. Did you see that? All, almost all guaranteed. Congratulations. But I want everyone to jump on the USC bandwagon, just so you know. That's the last thing I'll say about football here today. Uh, but let's get into today's message and why we are all here today. To be a church that shares the gospel of Jesus to the world. To be able to share our faith and hope that we have at a moment's notice. The moment someone calls on you, you know how to talk about your love and your hope that you have in Jesus. Now listen, today we're talking about evangelism. And I want to be very clear, there's a difference between discipleship and evangelism. Okay, so discipleship, or for discipling someone, is you and I connecting, me helping strengthen your faith in the word of God on a regular basis. We are connecting. Julian, you and I will never do that together. Just kidding. I love you, man. This guy has more energy than me. I got to tell you, you're contagious. We want a, a pastor's retreat this past week. You're funny. I would go to youth group if I was young again just to hang around you, just so you know that. Evangelism is us taking the good news of Jesus outside to people who don't know who Jesus is. So there's a huge difference in the two. I should be very, very clear. You were all called to be disciples and make disciples. We are also called, though, to go out and share the good news. In Matthew 4.19, this is what Jesus says to the disciples. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Saying in this moment, I am going to help you win souls. To win souls. Remember, know this. You are not a body with a soul. You are a soul with a body, okay? The body will die. It will go away. The wrinkles are going to set in sometimes. I, I looked at my hand the other day, and I saw more wrinkles, and I thought, man. And my dad looked at me and goes, that means you're getting old. So I don't know. I guess it starts in your hands first. But it will perish, and it will go down. But the soul will live forever. That's how important the soul is. Not that you shouldn't take care of your body, but if you had to put them on a mark together, the soul outweighs the body. Amen. And look it, 
I, I get evangelism for some people is, is very hard. I mean, the uh, chance to go speak about Jesus outside to people who don't know God can be a little frightening. And I asked a group of pastors because Pastor Hector made all of us go to a, a, a Bible retreat or a pastor's convention, which, thank you, I, I had a great time. Um, he bought one meal for us, and we, we really ran up that bill. We're like, man, appetizers, two steak dinners, dessert. We took advantage. Did we not, Julian? We took advantage. Amen. 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 Uh, but I asked him, I said to a pastor, a pastor friend of mine who was over there, and I said, hey, I'm preaching on evangelism. Why do you think that people have a hard time evangelizing outside the walls of church? And he said this to me. Mind you, there's about 350 pastors and a group of friends that I have all in here. And he says, I think mainly because they're ashamed of the gospel. Yeah. Which I'm not going to argue with someone who's a little older than me. Not as good looking, though, Mr. Picone. He wasn't, he wasn't better looking, but he was definitely older than me and had been preaching a lot longer than me. So I wasn't going to disagree with him right there. But I do not agree with that. Because I believe this, that if we were outside of church right now, I could ask you in public, do you believe in Jesus and that he died and raised again? And you guys would all say, yes. you're not ashamed of the gospel. What you are is a fear of failure. That's what evangelism uh, brings into the table is a fear of failure, right? Evangelism is us trying to convert someone to Jesus Christ, convert someone that we have fell in love with, somebody that had saved us. It's the, it's the love of our heart, of our soul in these moments. And when someone smashes what you love, it hurts. You remember being a little kid at five years old writing a love note like, oh, Miss Pastor Candy, I love you so much. Be my valentine. I've never done that, Steve. I've never done that. <laughs> but you women, the, the power that you guys have, you guys do that, you know, yes, no circle, and you put a big no, and you circle, and you slide it down, crushing my heart. The rejection in that moment hurts so much. So the idea of putting ourselves out there, of speaking about Jesus, sucks because of the failure that could come with it. Listen, we all fail every single day. I, I, not one person here could raise their hand and say, listen, oh, I'm a success every single day of the week. No one could say that. Ask the cowboy fan. <laughs> hey, I'm going to make it to all the other 31 teams. I guarantee, buddy, by the end of the day, I just want you to know it's not about the cowboys. Anyways, but we all have failure. All of it. You guys have gone through many, many jobs to finally get to the place that you want. Some of you guys have gone through many, many relationships to finally get the one that you want. Now, I'm not... I'm not advocating for that, but what I am saying is that there is a process that we all feel failure, especially if you're in sports. Any baseball people in here? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, love me some baseball. If we get three hits out of ten, we're a success. What is the failure rate of three of ten? Seventy percent of the time we fail. Seventy percent of the time. But in baseball... Why do we only focus on the 30% of the chance that we're winning? Because it doesn't conflict with our love. It doesn't conflict. It's, it's, it's something that's out there. It doesn't conflict with our love, but, but we're okay with it because we say, next time, I'm going to get a hit. Next time will be my time. You can't hold me down. Next time, I'm going to get a homer. We see that there's a boldness that comes inside of us that we say, next time's my time. Next time's my time. Do we say that about our relationship with Jesus and for sending it out there? That next time is my time. Next time is my time. I did ACN back in the day. Anybody remember what ACN was? Great. It's a multi-level marketing scheme. It's not really supposed to be doing it. But I had found this out, that if... Uh, that every three out of ten homes or people you came in contact with would say yes. That is a national thing for sales in general. That you will succeed three out of ten times. So the first seven times you did it, if you fail, the next three were supposed to be, or, or ideally you would have success. The difference between myself and say, example, Pastor Hector, you're a winner. But let's just say you're the one who only focused on the 70% seven, the of the failure rate. You stopped. Me knowing that the next three would go on, I would keep going. So every day, I, my job was to meet 10 people. And I knew 30% thir of the time it would be a yes. Well, meanwhile, I'm making all this money, and no one's making a dime because once one or two rejections come into play, they quit. 
Listen, the first time I ever evangelized, I was 17 years old. I just accepted Jesus in a parking lot, not in a church, not with a, a prayer of something, but in a parking lot. And a week later, I was pumped. Like, I was like, let's go, Jesus. I didn't know really any Bible verses. I don't really know if I really could say the Lord's Prayer without fumbling. But I was like, let's go talk about some Jesus. And they said, hey, there are a bunch of us going to go to Hammer Lane at the new Walmart in Stockton. And we're going to go spread the love of Jesus. And I said, I'm in. I'm 17 years old. You couldn't stop me. I knew everything at this time. I had been a Christian for a week. I was ready to be on the front lines. <laughs> That's what it is, right? I was, I was sold. I didn't even need the armor of God because I didn't know it existed. I was just ready to go. <laughs> That's a mistake. But anyways, we get there, and I remember it like it was yesterday. These waters said, this water will quench your thirst today, but the living water of Jesus will quench your thirst forever. Beautiful. I was in on that. I don't know why I was in on it. It sounded poetic and, and amazing and beautiful, but I was ready to go share the gospel with everyone I could come in contact with. Well, I was the youngest one there. I must have passed out 250 bottles to all these people. And the last lady in the front of Walmart, I give it to her. And this lady, she's probably a little more seasoned, uh, which means she was older. Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> Way older than you. I want you to know that, sir, because I know it's your birthday. I just want you to. But, but she was dressed as good as you. And she looked like she had her stuff together. And I thought, easy sell. Here, miss, here's living water. And she took the water, and I walked away all, yay, I succeeded. And she goes, hold on, hold on. She goes, what does this mean? What is living water? <laughs> what, did you, what did you ask? She's all, what is living water? And in my mind, all that could come to me was that one song, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Anybody know that, that Bible verse, right, David, right? It doesn't apply in this moment, okay? But my mind's racing. I can't share that in this. And I looked at her and I said, listen, I, I don't know. She goes, don't you think you should know what you're preaching before you put it out there? Look, at she was right in this moment, and I still wasn't wrong being out there. I had a boldness and faithfulness, but in that moment, I got to tell you what I told myself. 249 people accepted the bottle, and not one of them said anything, Pastor Hector, but the one that did crushed me. It stopped me in my tracks. God couldn't rain down blessing over blessing over blessing over blessing, and one thing from the enemy will stop most of us in our tracks. Why? Why could we not see that 30% of the time of winning is basically the 100% of the chance of winning, but we can't compute that in that moment? I told my pastor at that time, I will never, ever, ever do this again. And he took a page out of Charles Barkley, who I am not advocating for as the greatest uh, ambassador of human being life. But he said to me this, he said, David... Charles Barkley said this, and I believe it. If you're afraid to fail, you don't deserve to succeed. It's true. I accepted it from my pastor with an open heart because I respected him and I loved him, and I knew he, and, and, and I just knew where he was coming from in this, in this moment. Not to tear me down, but just saying, you're going to keep failing no matter what. Eventually, you'll have success to keep on pressing on in this moment and doing it. Listen, we have to change our mindsets when it comes to evangelism, that winning 30% of the time is more than enough. Amen. Winning 1% of the time is more than enough. Winning .008 is more than enough. You don't know who you're reaching in that moment. Maybe you reach the next Billy Graham. Maybe you reach the next Hector Gutierrez. Maybe you reach the next Julian. Maybe you reach the next you. 1% is more than enough. The, the focus of it has to be on the winning percentage. I don't care if it's 1%. Listen, Jesus himself was even rejected. In John 7, 5, it says this. It says, not even his brothers believed who he was. John 18, 40 says, the people rejected Jesus and asked for a killer again to be released. He was even rejected. The man to this day was still even rejected. Listen, as evangelists, we have to have a spirit of boldness. That it's okay to fail. Newsflash, you will fail and you will be rejected. Almost 70% of the time. 
In 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes this, But though we are already suffered and have been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. An example of the apostles' boldness in the face of suffering. Hebrews 13, 6 says this, The righteous are bold because they know that God is for them. Listen to me. And what they have to say is important. What we, as a church, as disciples, have to say is important. It is life or death for some. It will bring joy in moments of despair, and it will bring hope to the hopeless. What you have to say about the gospel is important, whether you know what living water is or isn't. You just share your testimony. God showed up when I was 17 years old, and he rescued me. That's why I believe. I don't know if that's living water, but I'll take some more of whatever that is. A boldness. Listen, when I first met my wife, and, uh, and I get her permission to share this, um, she could not pray out loud. She could not um, talk about Jesus out loud without bursting into tears every single second. And I'm not exaggerating at all. I would say, hey, we're going to pray uh, for so-and-so to get healed, and she would just start crying. Or they would say, hey, are you a Christian? And she'd be like, <gasps> and she would just get choked up. And it's hard because she's so good-looking, but not really when she cries. <laughs> and so in the eye mascara, Mr. Cold, oh, my God, Isis, is this online today? Yeah. Hi. She would bawl so hard about every time she talked about God that she could not get the words out of her mouth. And other people would tell me in the church, like, should she be an associate pastor's wife? Dude, shut up. <laughs> because what I saw, that the name of Jesus moved her to tears every time. That the love of God moved her to tears every time. That when she talked about the pain and the hurt, her mom beating up her mom or dad beating up her mom or the things that were going on in their life, that she was still saved and redeemed by Jesus and it moved her to tears every single time. And I got to tell you, as a 24-year-old newlywed Miss Sophia, I was okay with her being like this. One, because it was beautiful, but two, she would not evangelize because I've been rejected in evangelism. I didn't want to do it again. God's funny though, isn't he? It's funny how God can make someone who is scared become bold. Someone who has a stuttering problem be able to preach a message. All those things. My wife, a year later, goes, I'm tired of not being able to talk about the name of Jesus out loud. I'm tired of not being able to show my faith with people. And I said, okay, great. What are you going to do? She says, oh, not what I'm going to do, what we're going to do. I said, what are we going to do? And I didn't think this part was coming. She goes, we're going to share the name of Jesus with every person we come in contact with this next week. Not just one a day, Pastor Hector. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> every single person we come into contact with. I said, okay. And she goes, and then at the end of the week, we're going to line it up and we're going to show each other's numbers. After two days, this woman had invited over nine people to church and talked to 11 people about Jesus. Yes, some of the time being rejected, but still reaching eight to nine people. And I said, how is that even possible? She goes, I don't know, but how are you doing, babe? <laughs> Listen, I'm a slick talker. I can be your friend in an instant. I already know you and I should hang out. I'm a good time to hang out with. I mean, I could... We, we could be capadres, but talking about Jesus like this freaked me out. And I told her I haven't said one word to anyone about it yet. She goes, it's funny. A girl who could not talk about Jesus two days ago can share the love of Jesus to 11 people. You can brag about UC, USC football to anyone you come in contact with, but you can't do it about Jesus? Oh, here we go. She was in luck. Her car had a crack in the windshield that day, and a guy was coming to fix it. And I said to myself, I was pacing. I'm like, oh, I'm going to share Jesus with this person. Oh, man. Just then my wife walks in because it was her insurance and all that. She comes in. She goes, he's going to fix it right now, and then we'll, we'll, you know, it'll all be good. And she goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm going to share Jesus with this guy. She goes, you? Right now? 
And I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. And she goes, I'll be watching, right? So he's done. He knocks on the door. I take the credit card out there, and I'm like, hey. And by this time, I'm poetic. I mean, my words are good. I'm like, I just want you to know there's a Jesus who died for you, who rose again to take all your pain, all your hurt with him so that you can live with him in paradise. That we're, there's a God who wants to take the, the, the thoughts in your mind and make you rest at night. I mean, I was spitting it so good. I'm like, this guy's going to drop to his knees and accept the Lord. Like I could hear the light of heaven coming down and the clouds opening. This was my moment. 15 minutes, I'm preaching to this man. I turn back into the, the house and I see through the window my wife rolling on the ground laughing. What's so funny, I'm thinking to myself. 15 minutes, spewing it. This man turns around, no ingles, senor? <laughs> That's a true story. That is 100% a true story. My wife knew that he didn't speak English and she didn't tell me. After 15 minutes selling out Jesus in my heart to this person, all this stuff for him not to even know what I was saying. Yeah, it was great practice. I was like, oh, man, this is amazing. I think all my notes got mixed up. Listen, I don't share this story uh, about it because of the, the humor in it, which is definitely funny. I share it because of this, that a woman couldn't talk about Jesus at all, all of a sudden said, no, I'm going to talk about Jesus. I am going to step into my faith. I am going to be bold, and I am going to rely on the promises of God. Because she, my wife, did not overcome the world. Christ overcame the world. Her strength no longer resided in herself, but she says it resides in the word of God. And that's why she did it. In John 16, 33, it says this, I have told you all this, that you may have peace in me here on earth. You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why we believe and that's why we serve a living and wonderful God. The biggest portion of Jesus, though, that everyone saw was her heart. And I want to be very clear. That's what the Lord is after, is your heart. Not your mind, not your ability, not your strength, because those will all fade. But your heart, because if the heart changes, the rest follows. I don't have to tell any wife in here, the moment that we became in love with you guys and you had our heart, all of a sudden, we wanted to start picking up towels off the ground. All of a sudden, once you guys got us and we fell in love with you and you had our heart, I wanted to do dishes. All of a sudden, when you got my heart, I wanted to go to the ballet. I did. I didn't want to go, but I did it because she had my heart, because she had my heart. I know it's funny, and I say this, but everything changes when someone has your heart. If Jesus has your heart, it all changes. I don't want to be out late on Friday nights. I don't want to do the things that would cause division in my family. When he has your heart... It all changes. In Romans 10, 9 through 10, it says this, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul also writes in Ephesians that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Yeah. Your heart is everything. And that's where God wants to change it. That when you see the lost, you break for the lost. When you see struggle, you break for the struggle. Yeah. That's why you have a heart. Is that you can feel what God feels. When I pray to myself right now, yesterday and today, I say to myself, God, give us a heart that feels what you feel. That you could be walking by in the mall having the greatest date of your entire life. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait, wait, someone, someone hurts. Someone has a moment of pain. I thought it was so cool this past week. We went to that Monterey trip, and my wife texted me. She's like, hey, there's Christian music being played in this room. You got to come here. And so I go there. Miss Nicole follows behind pretty quickly to me. And all of a sudden, I don't know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And then there's a gothic, satanic woman behind the counter. And the Christian music is blaring. 
But before you got there, I'm like, how is this even possible? How is this possible that this Christian music is going on with this woman's got the tattoo on her forehead and all this over her shirt? My wife pointed to the lady on the ground, and I said, hey, did you put this music on? She goes, I did put this music on. And I said, um, is she okay with it? Genuine question, right? Because a satanic person doesn't want to hear any Christian music at all. And she says, because she knows I love her, she's okay with it. Because I gave her my heart and, my, and me, she's okay with it. What an area of a small seed being planted in that moment because she was okay. Listen, for some of you guys, you will be the only person in your circle that has the ability to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will be the only person. And I'll say it like this. Miss Nicole, are we good friends? Anthony, right, I'm a good friend with your wife, with your permission. We are good friends. And it would be like this, that I am in your circle. I know your kids. I know the boyfriend, too, with the great hair. I know you. We've talked. We've had lunch together. As many of you have the same circle of friends. Believer, not a believer. One day... She's going to be walking to heaven up to the pearly gates. And on the other side will be me walking the other way. And I'll turn to Miss Nicole and I'll say, I thought we were friends. I thought you said you loved me. Miss Nicole, you'll say, I do. I do love you. And I'll say, if you love me, why did you share Jesus with me? And then she'll say something to the effect, as many of you will say, I just thought you were going to reject it. You didn't even give me a chance. You didn't even give me a chance. You guys will all walk to the pearly gates. How many of your loved ones and the people that you're in your circle do you want to see walk in the other direction? None of them. I got you. I got you. Now it's time for the 49er fans to get a little bit of something. I'm just kidding. I'm going to stay away from it. But none of them. You want none of them going the opposite direction that you're going. You have to ask God to change your heart in this moment that it moves you to do something, to respond in a moment as the worship team comes up. Can I go to my last Bible verse, please? Uh, no, it's a, uh, yeah, right there. Um, I'm not into plagiarism, so a lot of the things that I said today came from Pastor Hector, Pastor Glenn, Pastor Aaron, Pastor Candy. I cited all my work. It came from the Holy Bible, too, as well, so I cited all my work, Okay. I'll be very clear. You are not only supposed to talk to people about the Jesus in your own home. It says this in Acts 28. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. Whose name? Jesus Christ. Jesus. He said, instead, you have filled all of Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death, the religious leaders are talking to the people saying, we told you not to talk about the name of Jesus in Jerusalem. Notice this. This does not say, and you filled all of them in the church. You filled all of them in your family. No, you filled all of them in the city. Listen, the church is a building. When you leave, the church leaves with you. The church, the, the, these four walls will stay here, but the church does not stay here. It moves out just like them. They didn't preach just in the churches or in the homes. They preached in the city to all that were there. And listen, as I wrap it up for all you guys and give Zach his space so he can do something really cool up here. We sit there and say, I don't know how to evangelize. And I get it. I understand. But I want to be very clear. Over five verses in the Bible are talking about seeds. Plant a seed. If I put a mustard seed in my hand right now, could you see it from where you're at? Not a chance. My wife looked at me last night at dinner and she goes, I don't know how to plant seeds. I go, babe, that's not your problem. You have no problem talking about God. The problem is you're trying to plant an orchard. You weren't called to plant an orchard, babe. Some of us are. Pastor Hector, you're, plant, you're called to plant an orchard. But sometimes you're called to plant a seed. A planting a seed is as simple as this. I know something's going on. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Seed planted. Like I know that I know life is hard right now. I promise, but I want you to know, lady in the blue, I'm praying for you. Those are seeds. 
Don't get wrapped up in the orchard. Don't get wrapped up that you have to have perfect English. And you got to know what living water is or something like that. When someone asks you why you believe, you say this. Because Jesus showed up when I was 17 years old and rescued me. There's nothing else I can say other than that. That is a seed. Church, will you stand with me? We're planting seeds on a daily basis, reaching the lost.